When one thinks of the Japanese new wave of the 1960s and 1970s, a number of directors come to mind. Shohei Imamura, Nagisa Ushima, Kiju Yoshida, Seijun Suzuki, and many more. Most of these directors made their mark as young creators fresh out of college or in new studio programs, which pushed them into the director's chair much earlier than previous generations. One such new wave director who is often counted lightly among their ranks is Koreyoshi Kurahara. We say lightly because in the English-speaking world, the majority of Kurahara's filmography is not easily available, and because of the sheer size of Kurahara's late period. In some respects, it could be argued that these later accomplishments overshadow Kurahara's new wave projects. But it should be said that Kurahara had a vast, wide-sweeping body of work produced over a nearly 40-year career. What began as a career in program direction within the new wave and the late stage of the Sun Tribe movement eventually evolved into a line of work which produced the film which remained the highest grossing domestic film for more than a decade. Today we're going back to the beginning and working through the lengthy, storied career of Koreyoshi Kurahara. Koreyoshi Kurahara was born on the island of Borneo in 1927. Kurahara began life in the city of Kuching, the capital of the Raj of Sarawak, also known as the State of Sarawak. Sarawak today is a part of Malaysia, but at the time was a British protectorate. Sarawak, and Borneo by extent, came under Japanese control at the start of World War II and became a British colony following the war before becoming a part of Malaysia in the early 1960s. Kurahara began here as his father managed a rubber plantation around Kuching, though admittedly Kurahara and his family did not remain in Sarawak long enough to see its Japanese occupation and later British rule. Once war broke out, Kurahara served in the Imperial Japanese Navy, though notably he never saw combat. Following World War II, Kurahara came to study film under Kajiro Yamamoto, a teacher of Ishiro Honda and mentor to Akira Kurosawa as well. This study happened while Kurahara was studying at the Nihon University College of Art. A few years later, in 1952, Kurahara went to work at Shochiku in an attempt to start his career in film. Before long, he left for Nikatsu in 1954, when they began producing films again. During the Japanese studio system's restructuring of 1941, which saw a massive consolidation between the pre-existing studios, Nikatsu had ceased creating and releasing films. It wasn't until nearly a decade after the end of the war that they got back to work. Only a few years after moving to Nikatsu, Kurahara was offered a job directing, beginning the longest stint of consistent directorial efforts in his career. We should note here some of the family connections with Kurahara at least one of which may have informed some of his thematic decisions as time went on. Kurahara was the older brother of Koretsugu Kurahara, a pink director working primarily in the 1970s who had assistant director credits on the first Stray Cat Rock film and Massacre Gun, both of which we've covered on the channel. More importantly, Koreyoshi Kurahara was the nephew of Korehito Kurahara, a critic specializing in literature who wrote essays on leftist political thought and who was jailed for a time due to his perceived treasonous beliefs. This incarceration, of course, happened prior to World War II, when Japan was under the direct influence of nationalism, and in a time when any political rhetoric or thought seen as un-Japanese was punished by jail or worse. Leftist political prisoners were notably freed by American occupiers as a sign of goodwill to the Japanese citizenry following the war, though this course was reversed rather quickly once the communists, socialists, and anarchists actually started organizing and advocating for change in the country. Once Korehito Kurahara was freed, he became a major member of the Japanese Communist Party. We bring all of this up because of the left-leaning and class-influenced political slant Koreyoshi Kurahara's films tend to take, especially when we are considering his work in the 1960s, which we have and will continue to cover here on the channel. We can't help but wonder if Kurahara becoming politically conscious during and after the war didn't come as a result of seeing his uncle's advocacy, not to mention his treatment by the imperial government. Kurahara released his directorial debut with 1957's I Am Waiting. The film stars Yujiro Ishihara, who had gotten his start with Nikatsu's two largest Sun Tribe projects a year prior. I Am Waiting concerns one young man's struggles to grapple with a self-destructive hostess and the corrupt gangster holding sway over her life, lending a sense of drama to Kurahara's early career. 
We wish we could provide a thorough look at every single film on which Kurahara worked throughout his career, but unfortunately the vast majority of his filmography remains obscure in English, making this a difficult task. Additionally, between his debut and 1970, Kurahara released 26 of his 40 films, this total appearing if we count TV movies in the total. Needless to say, if we covered 40 or even 26 films in detail, we would be here all day. We hope for that reason you'll forgive us for skimming over some of his less available work in the English-speaking world while examining the broad movements within his early career. That being said, Kurahara's early films, which remain unavailable in English, are noted as being largely post-Sun Tribe projects. By this, we mean to say that they are violent or raucous youth films which arrived thanks to and as a reaction to the brief stint of canonical Sun Tribe films from the mid-1950s. For more information on this movement, we would encourage you to check out our videos on Bakumatsu Taioden or The Warped Ones. The latter of these was Kurahara's perhaps best-known contribution to the post-Sun Tribe movement, though some claim this film among the ranks of the movement itself. Outside of these reactions to the Sun Tribe era, Kurahara seems to have produced fairly simple program pictures following typical trappings for 1960s-era Nikatsu. Though, of course, they all undoubtedly contained Kurahara's signature flair for hyperbolic and stylish brashness. During this era, Kurahara collaborated many times with Yujiro Ishihara and other Nikatsu regulars, and brought jazz into the fold of his films via the works of Max Roach. While the decade began with a noir project, Intimidation, it quickly slid into riotous youth and nihilism with The Warped Ones. Kurahara's political leanings became apparent in how films like these, as well as more typical program pictures like I Hate But Love, handle class. His films are populated by the poor and disenfranchised who must face off against the wealthy and those ignorant to or infantilizing of their struggles. The script is somewhat flipped with I Hate But Love in that we here follow Ishihara as a well-to-do television host. Unlike the upper-class antagonist of Intimidation, however, this man's journey comes full circle when he is reminded of the poverty from which he came only a few years prior. He throws away his wealth and fame in order to assist a young woman with whose class struggle he identifies. Not long after, Kurahara brought race into the mix with the explosive Black Sun. This film centers around an American GI who flees military police pursuit with the help, and sometimes hindrance, of a young Japanese man living in the remains of a decrepit church. Here, the struggle is put on full display between two groups pushed to the bottom of society by their respective rulers. They're encouraged to fight one another and to grow prejudiced against the opposite group. But, at the end of the film, we see that they're simply a pair of outcasts fighting over the scraps left for them by those above. Kurahara's final film from this period, which has become easily available in English, Thirst for Love, is at first blush somewhat of an anomaly for this common thread of class difference. This time, Kurahara examines an exceptionally wealthy family in an adaptation of a novel by Yukio Mishima. When we dig a little deeper, however, we see that even in this setting of opulence, Kurahara was dissecting the minutia of class, before he had looked at upper-class folks combating the lower class and lower-class people squabbling amongst themselves. With Thirst for Love, on the other hand, Kurahara examines how the upper class further breaks down into a hierarchy decided by lineage, as well as mind games and legal struggles. The film explores a failing dynasty within a wealthy family as the various adult children of the patriarch scheme for their inheritance, all while combating the encroachment of their deceased brother's wife. Said wife is cozy with the father as they've become something of lovers since her husband's passing. Meanwhile, we follow a plot where one of the family's servants and the wife have an on-and-off fling. This portion more closely resembles the interrogation of class typical in Kurahara's work of this period. The plot concerning the family as a whole remains important to note as well, as it further expands one's understanding of Kurahara's worldview. Just how cyclical yet pragmatic he was concerning class differences and struggle. Kurahara left Nikatsu in 1967 after more than a decade directing for the studio. At this point, he became independent but continued to thrive for several decades to come. As time went on, Kurahara's production rate began to slow, though his releases remained important. He began the 1970s with several more films before moving into some television work. The films from this period remain obscure to English speakers, unfortunately, meaning we can't properly cover it in depth. 
As for his television work, more or less none of it has made it into English, which is a sad truth that applies to many older Japanese dramas and series. Throughout the 1970s, Kurahara began to expand his horizons beyond Japan's borders and the trappings of his earlier studio projects. 1971's Bad Girl Mako was a bad girl revenge flick, while 1973's Sunset Sunrise was a rambling road film concerning a group making their way to Kathmandu, Nepal, one way or another. 1975's Rainy Amsterdam was a drama concerning a pocket community of Japanese company workers and traders living in Amsterdam. Perhaps most well-known in this part of the world was 1978's The Glacier Fox. This was a documentary concerning a fox family eking out an existence in Hokkaido, the northernmost large island of Japan. The film details the struggles and triumphs of the group in spite of their harsh environment and the gradually increasing human influence and destruction of their home. The Glacier Fox was extremely well received by fan scores, but unfortunately has not seen release in English past its 1990 VHS release, though it has been re-released in Japan on DVD. As we can see from this cross-section of Kurahara's 1970s work, as soon as he went independent, Kurahara set his sights on further shores and new styles. From these brief summaries, even, we can still detect a hint of his earlier leftist sentiments. From the foxes being harmed by humans, to the cast of rainy Amsterdam being stranded in a foreign country, it would appear that Kurahara maintained his ideals into middle age and beyond. The 1980s were equally eventful for Kurahara, in one way arguably being his most impactful period. As the director entered his late period, he maintained his slower pace of output, but continued with both his leftist narratives and his broader, more global approach to filmmaking. At the start of the decade, Kurahara co-directed Zō Monogatari with Narimichi Hino. The film was narrated by Eiji Okada, who had previously narrated The Glacier Fox. Seeming like something of a spiritual successor to the earlier project, Zōō Monogatari, or Elephant Story in English, is a documentary about the lives of elephants in Africa. This one remains even more obscure than The Glacier Fox in English, and even seems difficult to find in Japanese. In 1981, Kurahara co-directed another project, this time the two-part The Gate of Youth with Kinji Fukasaku. These two serve as a gritty drama about a mining town involving a father, played by Fukusaku regular Bunta Sugawara, and his family as they attempt to survive and retain their dignity in spite of the rough working conditions. The Gate of Youth is not unlike the Glacier Fox on paper, in fact, if you just replace the foxes with mining town residents. Arguably, one of Kurahara's largest films, and certainly his largest in terms of box office numbers, Antarctica, debuted in 1983. Antarctica concerns the real-life story of the Japanese Antarctic Research Expedition and their sled dog team. The humans are forced into an emergency evacuation of the facility, while the dogs are abandoned at the base. The bulk of the film is split between the researchers back in Japan dealing with the implications and grief of leaving the dogs behind, and the dogs themselves attempting to survive the inhospitable conditions of the base. Antarctica earned its reputation as a major production, taking three years to complete and garnering a major reaction at home. It won multiple awards in Japan and became the highest grossing domestic film for 14 years after its release, supplanted only by Princess Mononoke all the way in 1997. The film is on Blu-ray in Japan and subtitles are easy enough to come by, but sadly it has not been reissued in America since its initial VHS release decades back. Kurahara directed several more films as the decade wore on, though none have had major impacts outside of Japan and all remain unfortunately obscure in English. As we examine the plots of these stories, a pattern continues to emerge between his late 70s work and throughout the 1980s. With the narratives expanding beyond Japan's borders and looking to other areas of the world for a commonality. In this case, humans and other animals attempting to survive the extreme conditions present on our shared planet. 1985's Haru no Kane deals with the domestic life of a museum director and his disaffected wife. This type of domestic examination seems to have continued in his next film, 1986's Michi. This time around, our narrative takes place in Japan, but relates to a sort of wanderlust. Michi deals with a long-distance truck driver who gives up the ghost and comes home, 
only to find that the still life isn't as easy as he would have hoped. 1988's Umie, aka CU, concerns a group of folks involved in the Paris-Dakar rally, a race which lasts almost two weeks, which originally occurred between Paris, France, and Dakar, Senegal. Much like Antarctica, Umie was shot on location. It also appeared similar to his earlier film, 1969's 5,000 Kilometers to Glory, also known as Safari 5000. This was another picture concerning a rally race, in this case centering on the 1969 East African Safari Rally. While the 1980s saw Kurahara approaching larger and more ambitious films, the 1990s are the point at which his efforts completely fell off. 1991's Strawberry Road was based upon a memoir by Yoshimi Ishikawa. Ishikawa had spent several years as an immigrant working on a California strawberry farm at the height of the Vietnam War in the 1960s. Naturally, this type of global story involving some level of class awareness and fishes out of water drew Kurahara's attention. Sadly, Strawberry Road would prove to be Kurahara's final theatrical film, though not his final project overall. From what we can discern from the information available to us, all of Kurahara's late period works seem to play as variations on tales of domesticity, unsettled family dynamics, or perhaps more importantly the struggle to survive in the world. They mostly acknowledge that this type of struggle transcends borders and even species. As films like Antarctica showed, Kurahara's sensitivity to the human, or perhaps more accurately the earthling condition, resonated with global audiences, which made it all the more a shame that his films remain so unknown in English. As it turns out, this type of sensitivity would express itself once more, though in his final homecoming, Kurahara explored his sense of humanity from a decidedly Japanese perspective. Kurahara's final production was released in 1995. Co-directed with Roger Spottiswood, Hiroshima explores the implications of the decision to use a nuclear bomb in an aggressive manner for the first time in history. The film examines the Japanese and American narratives, hence having two directors. Hiroshima is noted for its blending of genre, juxtaposing acted portions with interviews creating a brutal portrait of that fateful day in August 1945. As we alluded to earlier, this was a television movie, but thanks to it being commissioned by Showtime, a premium cable network, the filmmakers did not have to worry about restraint in the name of pleasing advertisers. As such, the film remains well received since its original airing on Showtime. As a bonus, given this was produced by an American company, Hiroshima remains one of the exceptions in Kurahara's career, remaining available in English to this day. After production on Hiroshima wrapped, Kurahara seems to have retired from filmmaking. We couldn't find any reports of him constructing further projects throughout the remainder of the decade. As with most English information on Kurahara, news tends to just sort of fall off into obscurity. This means that Hiroshima remains the final part of Kuriyoshi Kurahara's lengthy, vast career in film. Eight years later, he passed away of pneumonia at the age of 75, leaving behind several dozen films and a legacy of innovation, achievement, and above all, a deep empathy for his fellow inhabitants of this planet. While much of Kurahara's filmography remains obscure to us English speakers, relegated to VHSs or else never released here in the first place, or worse, lacking modern releases even in Japan, what is available is a small mountain of gold. If you haven't already, we encourage you to check out the handful of Kurahara's films released in English in the past few decades. They're not all the cream of the crop, but they all betray the master of his craft who was Koreyoshi Kurahara.